Hello, and uh, welcome to another session of the 68th Annual Utah State Historical Society Conference. I'm Jed Rogers uh, with the Utah Historical Quarterly. It was an honor to host this session on national parks. Um, the uh, session was recorded on September 17th, 2020, and uh, it starts about 30 seconds after Lance Newman had begun speaking. So um, just be aware of that. Now, as we're talking about uh, national parks in Utah, it's important to acknowledge that Utah is the traditional homeland of the Ute, Shoshone, Goshute, Paiute, Navajo, and other indigenous peoples. So um, with that, uh, I'm sure that you'll enjoy this session. Uh, here is Lance Newman, who is co-editor of the National Park Reader Series, published by the University of Utah Press, which we'll be hearing about uh, in this session. Um, so here's Lance. Thank you. Writings about uh, the each park. And the books feature selections by nationally known authors, as well as historical figures, along with long-term local residents and rangers and park employees. They're, they're designed to be something really quite different from the usual fare that you find in national parks, bookstores, and gift, uh, gift uh, shops, rather than um, stories of uh, hijinks and high adventure uh, and big personalities with big hats. These are designed to um, really gather the best writing and the most, um, the most influential writing about each of these landscapes. Uh, so each collection includes exploration and travel narratives, poetry, creative nonfiction, and since park interpretation as an enterprise over the decades has tended to focus on the experiences of solitary white men in the wilderness, uh, we've worked intentionally to include native voices, women, people of color in these readers uh, in order to represent the, a, a true diversity of, of experiences of the, the landscapes. Uh, each of the readers is edited by somebody who has a direct connection to the park that uh, they are creating a reader for. And you'll hear examples of those three relationships, uh, or three examples of those kinds of relationships from uh, our panelists in a few minutes. So I'm going to um, sh show you a slide of the readers that have been published so far. Um, the Rocky Mountain Park National Rocky Mountain National Park Reader by James Pickering, the Zion Canyon Reader, the Glacier Park Reader, uh, and the Capitol Reef Reader is the most recent by Stephen Trimble. There are several more in the uh, production process, including readers for Arches and Canyonlands, which we'll be hearing today, as we're going to be focusing for this conference on the three desert three of the desert parks in Utah: Arches, Canyonlands, and Capitol Reef. And our main goal today really is to, to share stories, share our stories about how the literary history of the parks has enriched our own experiences of those landscapes. Um, because that's really the goal of the series as a whole, to enrich and deepen visitors' experiences of the parks. Um, and since this is about a, a panel about the literary history of parks, I thought I'd start us off by reading a short poem uh, from the Grand Canyon Reader. It's, um, it's a poem by Michael Cabote, a, a Hopi artist, um, the son of Fred Cabote, who uh, is the artist who painted the murals in the Desert View Watchtower at Grand Canyon. Uh, and it goes like this. Mike, look at how pretty the canyon is, Francis shouted. I can't look, I'm driving. Besides, I'll make my final journey to the underworld through the Sipapuni, I answered. A spiritual place, our symbolic womb kiva, the place of emergence through which we enter our underworld heaven. Quote, the Grand Canyon discovered in 1540 by Pedro Cardenas, the National Parks pamphlet read. I smiled knowing that my people always knew the Grand Canyon was there and didn't need to be discovered. Cardenas came with Hopi guides, and I learned how lies are twisted to sound true. But on my final journey, I promised to stop at all the sightseeing points, to mingle with the tourists, and to give them my last earthly trinkets 
before I descend into my eternal womb, Kiva. And now we'll come back to Utah. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists next, and then I'm going to ask them to tell us the stories of how they came to care about or connect with their park. And the panelists will follow the thread of the conversation from there, and I'll stay mostly behind the scenes, although I invite viewers to make comments and ask questions in the chat, um, and I'll introduce those to the conversation as it seems appropriate. So uh, Jeff Nichols is a transplanted New Yorker. He's lived in Utah since 1989 and has taught history at Westminster College for 25 years. His interests include the social, cultural, and environmental history of Utah and the West, and he's the author of Prostitution, Polygamy, and Power, as well as the co-editor of Playing with Shadows, Voices of Dissent in the Mormon West. He's currently editing the Arches National Park Reader um, and uh, often spends time at his home at Pat Creek Ranch, just down the road from Arches National, National Park. Uh, Melanie Armstrong is a faculty member at the ma uh, in the Masters of Environmental Management program at Western Colorado University. She's the author of uh, Germ Wars, The Political Nature uh, of America's and America's Landscape of Fear. Let me try that again. Germ Wars, The Politics of Nature and America's Landscape of Fear. And she's the co-author of Environmental Realism, Challenging Solutions. In 2018, she founded the Center for Public Lands. And she's a 2020 National Geographic Explorer investigating how Native American treaty rights influence research, resource management. And she's hosting a field school on co-management of public lands at Bears Ears National Monument. Um, Melanie's currently editing the Canyonlands National Park Reader. And then Stephen Trimble began his writing and photography career as a park ranger, including a season uh, at Capitol Reef National Park. He's received the Sierra Club's Ansel Adams Award for Photography and Conservation, the National Cowboy Museum's Western Heritage Wrangler Award, uh, a Doctor of Humane Letters from his alma mater, Colorado College, honoring his efforts to increase our understanding of Western landscapes and peoples. He has a home outside Torrey, Utah, where he and his family are proud stewards of a nature conservancy conservation easement. And he tells that fascinating story in Bargaining for Eden, the, the fight for the last open spaces in America. And the Capital Reef Reader uh, is Steve's 25th book. So um, Steve, why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about how you connected with Capital Reef and why, why you decided it would be a good idea to take on the task of editing a reader for the park. Thank you, Lance, and I would be delighted to do that. And thank you for the poem from Michael Cabote, too. That was a, a wonderful invocation of our native connections to the whole, whole Colorado Plateau. Uh, I'm gonna be going in and out of the reading that I've developed for my book. And so I'm gonna go to screen sharing to answer your question. So let's see if I can make this work. There are just a couple of clicks I have to do here to make this work. So why was I so intent on editing this book? Remember that ad campaign during the centennial of the National Park Service in 2016? Find your park. This is my park. And so the Capitol Reef Reader was really a labor of love. I arrived in the park in 1975 to work a season for the National Park Service as a ranger, knowing only a little. I was 24. I'd worked as a park ranger briefly at Arches and for a season in Colorado. I'd published my first little book for Park Natural History Associations, but I was a newcomer to all things Capitol Reef. This was a long time ago. When I first went out camping that summer, I was still sleeping on top of picnic tables because I was afraid of scorpions. But I came to Fruta, the park headquarters, and lived for a summer under the big red cliff, tuning my days to the sunrises and sunsets, watching for the mule deer come down from, from the mesa every evening. Usually they came down after dark or when I didn't have my camera, but there was this one glorious evening when those three bucks came down and I grabbed my camera and got this photograph. I was hired as a seasonal in part to photograph, to photograph and write for the park. 
I wrote and photographed a general interpretive book for the Natural History Association, emphasizing the backcountry. And I wrote and took pictures for a Hickman Bridge Trail Guide, both publications long out of print. But when I write, I research too. So nearly 45 years ago, I began reading everything I could find about the park, and I've never stopped. I'm endlessly intrigued with the unending challenge of responding to this place in language and capturing, capturing capital reef in words. And so when Lance and Dave Stanley and John Alley came to me and asked if I would edit the Capital Reef book, I was not gonna let anybody else do this book. This is my book. And then I also have to thank Dave Livermore at the Nature Conservancy, who gave us a small grant so we could run color photographs all the way through the book. And so it was a total delight. And I look forward to hearing the stories from Melanie and Jeff as well. I love that story and I, and I really appreciate those images. They're really powerful. I'm gonna share a scrappy image in a moment, but I'll get to that in, in just a moment. So I'm Melanie Armstrong and I think it's easy to say that I care about Canyonlands and wanted to write this book because I lived and worked there for five years. I was the manager of the visitor services operation at the Island in the Sky District of Canyonlands National Park from 2011 until I came here to Western Colorado in 2015. But it's a lot more complicated than, than that, I think. Um, when you're a park ranger, people always, always ask you, what is your favorite park? And I think they must be looking for something in that question and perhaps an understanding of their own ways of valuing parks or evaluating a place, or maybe they're just making conversation. <laughs> Um, but I always felt like they were trying to tap into some sort of expertise as if my personal experiences living in a place were somehow different or more valued or more insightful than their experiences as a visitor. So in all honesty, I might not say that Canyonlands is my favorite park. Gasp. <laughs> the first park I worked at was Arches and I spent the most time um, of my career working at one of those big Y parks which gives both of those parks kind of a clean nostalgia in my memory. It was at Canyonlands that I was challenged in my job. I struggled. I explored new ideas about the world, about myself, and I had opportunities to put them into practice. And I learned more about how parks are made than I ever had known before, which was great insight for developing this book. So what I'll say for my why is it's because of my effort to reconcile my work as a scholar with work as a ranger with the complex identities I have for my own life experiences and intellectual explorations. So to illustrate this, I want to share with you, here's my scrappy image at the risk of putting things on Facebook and all sorts of live places that you don't actually want to have put live. So this is a, an image of a slide I recently stumbled upon of my family traveling in Canyonlands in front of Angel Arch. And yeah, I'm the one covering my face on the far right with my hair. Um, but I, I looked at this image and I, I see the contradictions that I carry with me as a park manager and as a person who loves this place. I see in this, a family, lots of young people, there are babies in arms, my grandmother in that picture. And we're traveling to a place, you wouldn't know it in the picture, but we, we got there by vehicle. You would assume that by the ages and the, and, the, um, and the size of the group and so forth, the lack of packs that we have in this image. This wash, um, or this arch up Salt Wash in Canyonlands is now closed to vehicle access. It's a place that um, has been closed to much controversy um, recently due to the impacts of vehicle travel up the salt wash and impacts to both um, historical sites, archeological sites, native sites, and of course the ecology and the ecosystem itself. And so when I see that picture, it brings out the contradictions that I carry within myself as someone who, who loves to explore place in many recreation forms, um, but also recognizes that places are always complex. Um, I have 
spent much of my life hearing my grandmother bemoan the fact that she can no longer drive to Angel Arch. And that was something that she valued. Um, even as I hear resource managers in Canyonlands think or speak to um, the need to keep that drainage closed and protect it. Um, I see in this picture the memories of me recreating with my family. I have no adult memories of traveling to Angel Arch, but I clearly was there. There's a photograph that shows that I was there. But I have strong memories of this type of recreation that I experienced with my family. And, and I recognize the value of that type of recreation in shaping my identity today. So my interest in writing this book came from a desire to explore those contradictions um, as they relate to me individually, my community, and also a broader social group, um, including those who visit Canyonlands and who seek some understanding of the place that's maybe a little more complex than simply asking, which is your favorite park? Well, I came to writing about arches. I'm much more of a, ha have much more of a tourist background uh, than either Steve or, or Melanie have. Um, I think it probably does date from a classic 1972 uh, family drive all the way from upstate New York to the west in the, the family truckster, the Ford LTD station wagon. Um, and on the sort of spur of the moment, my father decided we should go to Mesa Verde. And that was the first I'd ever seen uh, the high desert country. And I just really, really loved it from the start. But it was a long time before I got back to it and a, a long time before I got to, to Arches. Um, <clears throat> in 1989, I came to Utah to teach Navy ROTC of all things. Um, and we started going and, and, and visiting Moab quite regularly. And it was one of these places that um, my wife and I had both sort of dreamed about having some kind of a little tiny getaway place somewhere. And every, every time we would take a trip uh, somewhere, I would say, well, how about here? How about Bozeman? How about uh, uh, Northern California? Whatever. Well, it's too far. And my wife would always say, don't forget the LaSalle Mountains. Don't forget Moab. So we finally... Uh, about 15 years ago, we built a little straw bale house at Pack Creek Ranch, and our nearest neighbors were Ken and Jane Slight. They've since moved slightly further away, but only a couple of hundred feet. Uh, Edward Abbey's last in-laws <laughs> were neighbors down there. Uh, both of them were quite elderly and have since passed. Uh, and we started visiting Arches quite regularly, um, doing a lot of the classic awful, maybe, windshield tourism. Uh, driving around um, Arches has sort of a, a well-designed single route, almost single route, uh, that takes you to the places. Um, but along the way, lots of uh, on-foot travel as well, and those are much more memorable. Um, my wife and I traveling along the very icy trail that Bates Wilson had apparently blasted out clandestinely with, uh, with dynamite without getting permission uh, to Delicate Arch on a full moon night. Um, yet another clandestine trip seems to be a theme. Um, with my dog and a friend of mine, we went up a uh, courthouse wash from, from the road, from 191, right uh, uh, north of, of Moab with Dave Stanley, who would later become the editor of this, this reader. Um, we explored uh, Fiery Furnace and found a uh, roosting great uh, horned owl. And we mostly found it by the incredibly large mound of poop and um, hapless mouse bones that were lying uh, uh, underneath it. Um, so I began working on a an environmental history of the Moab Valley, which I'm still working on. And because uh, my colleagues and friends, Lance and Dave, knew that I was working on that, they asked me to take on the Arches Reader, uh, which I'm delighted to do. Uh, and I've since spent even more time down there. Thanks to all three of you. and. Um, Let's let's open this up to a conversation now, uh, and and look for parallels, contrasts um, between 
the parks, the histories of the parks, and especially the literature of the parks. Um, and uh, I think it'd be interesting to, to see if a chronological um, arc develops in the conversation and start with um, the, the origin stories of the parks. What do we know about their early days, about the ways that they were perceived by early visitors, by explorers, by, um, by native peoples who either uh, moved through the spaces or used the spaces routinely? Um, what do we know about the, what do we learn from the, uh, the textual history of the parks about them? And I'll, I'll let, um, I won't call on individual people. I'm going to hope that this turns into a conversation. Well, the, or the origin story of the park that I was thinking about when you asked that question, Lance, was the park itself, the national park. You know, the, uh, the conservation story that would begin in the 20th century. But if we go back way farther to native people, then it's an entirely different origin story. You know, I think what catches me in this is the difference between the park and the place. And um, if we're with Capitol Reef, that makes me think about how I define Capitol Reef. You know, I didn't stick with the, the actual straight line boundaries on the map, but I thought of Capitol Reef country as beginning with the big view off the east rim of Boulder Mountain looking out over the water pocket full, the big geographic feature of the park, over to the Henry Mountains. And then the water pocket fold itself, which runs for 100 miles north to south, and really does define the park. So there's the place and the park. How about you guys? Well, let me, let me talk a bit about the park, just about arches, because it's kind of a fun story. And I'm going to share just a quick uh, photo here. So this is the this is the proposed cover that I'd like to, to use. Um, but here's the man that is generally considered to be, um, oh, the discoverer that uh, uh, that people paid attention to. Uh, Alexander Ringhofer was a Hungarian prospector. And he was either prospecting or hunting deer, depending on whose story you believe. And um, either he or one of his sons stumbled across a, a place that, that Alex Ringhofer called, named, uh, the Devil's Garden. And he was really struck by that. And quite interestingly, I think, the first thing he thought to do, the first person he thought to tell about it was... Um, the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. So he wrote to them and he wrote to their, um, basically their, their, their tourist manager, uh, a guy named Frank Wadley, and said, hey, this is a wonderful uh, possible uh, uh, tourist attraction. And Frank Wadley, whose job it was, of course, to increase traffic on his railroad, um, grabbed a photographer named George Beam, and they came over from Colorado and they took some photos but the problem was they were asking people in Moab, where's the devil's garden? Um, they went in with Ringhofer and they took a photo, George Beam took a photo of what we call Tower Arch, which is in the Northwest part of the park, what is today called Klondike Bluffs. Um, they contacted Stephen Mather, the director of the park service, who sent a surveyor out that surveyor also, uh, he wasn't able to get hold of Ringhofer. Well, where's the Devil's Garden? Everyone in Moab's like, we've never heard of the Devil's Garden. So they got a local guide to bring them in there. They ended up going to what we now know of as the Windows section, which is sort of in the, the southeast, which is full of arches and holes and windows and just wonderful uh, views. So this must be it. This is the Devil's Garden. So they wrote to Mather, said, this is the place we ought to do it. Um, there was this tremendous comedy of errors. George Beam and Wadley realized they're, they're in the wrong place. Um, this goes on for five or six years. When the National Monument was declared in 1929, it did not include uh, Alexander Ringhofer's Devil's Garden. 
um, and included a different place that they named Devil's Garden. Um, it included the windows, and it was not until uh, the park was greatly expanded, a uh, monument was greatly expanded in 1938, it finally included Ringhofer's original discovery. But I think that gives you a sense of how many extraordinary things there are to see, uh, just how many archers there are, that, and, and how relatively unknown they were uh, to the people in the area. I love that challenge to the idea of, of park versus place. And I think perhaps um, Canyonlands embodies that, that sense of parkhood as much as anything and continues to in you know contestations over the spaces around Canyonlands and so forth. And so so I look at, with a little bit of um, interest or well a lot of interest and a little bit of envy towards these these sort of um, long origin stories that are associated with parkhood that come from Capitol Reef and Arches with Canyonlands being a much a much newer park, a much newer place. So I don't know, Lance prompted us towards chronology. So I'm, I'm sort of holding back with our, my 1964 origin story here. But, but I think nodding to that, that longer story of, of exploration and, and visitation in place certainly complicates things. Well, I'm going I'm to go right for the origin story of the park and show you some more slides. Let me see if I can make this one work as well as the last one did. Here we go. There's a lot of controversy in all of these parks, probably le maybe less so at Arches than at Canyonlands and Capitol Reef, but I, I didn't shy away from those stories. And Capitol Reef begins with not so much controversy, but with, with local impetus, local energy, kind of the way Jeff described Arches. When Ephraim Pechtol and Joseph Hickman pushed for a Wayne Wonderland National Park named after Wayne County, to boost the county economy, what they got in 1937, after years of work, was a relatively small Capitol Reef National Monument that remained unfunded for decades and was even open to uranium mining in the 1950s. And then came the 60s, and actually a name that all of us could be using is Bates Wilson. Um, Melanie will be talking about Bates the most, but Bates was the, the uh, longtime superintendent at Arches, and when Kennedy was president, Bates got together with Stuart Udall, the Secretary of the Interior, and Udall's uh, writer-in-residence, Wallace Stegner, who knew Capitol Reef well, and they started talking about expanding Capitol Reef National Monument. And when Park Superintendent Bob Hyder was assigned to draw boundaries, he did that pretty much unilaterally. There was this little national monument, Capitol Reef National Monument, and then the um, the National Monument is the, the light line that he drew on a map. And when Bob Hyder drew those boundaries to expand that small monument sixfold, he did it in secret. He asked his wife to type up his proposal because his secretary at Capitol Reef was Afton Taylor, the wife of Wayne County rancher Don Taylor, who was the president of the Wayne County Cattlemen's Association. And Hyder didn't want to blow his cover. And then that that made it to the desk of Lyndon Johnson, who, who dithered all the way to the very last day. And when he was dressing for Richard Nixon's inauguration, basically when he's putting on his pants, he signed an executive order expanding Capitol Reef to that outer boundary. Here in Southern Utah, not everyone was pleased. Boulder Town over the mountain briefly changed its name to Johnson's Folly in protest. Nonetheless, within two years, Congress made Capitol Reef a national park, and the water pocket fold was protected all the way south to Halls Creek Narrows for the first time. And today, 1.3 million visitors come to Capitol Reef in a single year. The controversies just keep going. There's, there's a dirt road that goes all the way up and over the water pocket fold called the Burr Trail that became passable to Jeeps during the uranium boom and then winds its way across the Circle of Cliffs over to, to the town of Boulder and takes off from Notum Road that goes all the way up and down the length of the fold. And local officials, county officials, have dreamed of big tourism 
and wanted that road paved for decades. And we've been fighting it over ever since the 1980s. I've been writing uh, letters to agencies since the 1980s. And in the Capital Reef Reader, I, I use some words from Jared Farmer, the historian who's written about this, who talks about the renegade paving that, that is now paved the Burr Trail all the way up to the park boundary in every direction, and talks about going back at one point to pay a visit to the Burr Trail after fresh paving and finding this graffiti in the circle cliffs at the bridge over the gulch. And he wrote about that. And when I found that excerpt, I thought to myself, you know, I saw the same graffiti and by God, I think I have a picture of it somewhere. So I dug around in my files and was quite delighted that I was reasonably well organized enough to find it. And so we used that picture in the book as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna interject a question here and um, ask about what some of these early figures, Ringhofer and Bates Wilson uh, and Wallace Stegner, but also people like Kent Frost and Ken Slight, um, what did they see in these landscapes and how did they articulate what they saw to help the public um, come to see these, as, these landscapes as something other than, than barren, inhospitable wastelands? As, as I've been reading these narratives, I'm so struck by sort of a, a quintessential idea of exploration and that, that thirst to have an unending place to explore and, and what that represented to um, these, these sort of wandering characters from, from history who were, who were seeking that. Um, Canyonlands, you know, with Ken Frost, Bass Wilson, and, and others have a story of those people turning it into a livelihood that that struck me as well the the overlap between this this desire to to see discover explore and make a living doing it yeah i think the theme of of work um ringhofer wrote a follow-up letter that talked about all the uh the, the, the claims he had staked within what became Arches, uh, his proposal for roads. He wanted to be, uh, uh, wanted to be an early uh, tourist entrepreneur. Um, <clears throat> Ken Slight, of course, was a tourist entrepreneur, uh, but, but someone with always this keen sense and, and delight in the landscape, in, in introducing it to people and showing it to people, which certainly Bates Wilson shared. Uh, evidently, there's nothing he liked better than cooking for people in his notorious Dutch oven and showing them uh, these places, either in Arches or in the, the Canyonlands country. Yeah, the, the first explorers in Capitol Reef country were the geologists working for the Powell Survey and the Wheeler Survey, who looked out from the rim of Boulder Mountain and then tried to capture the place in words. They were trying to understand it as scientists and people like Clarence Dutton were trying to, to also act as, as amazingly good uh, literary narrative storytellers and, and capture that view in words that we still quote. And then almost immediately after that, the, um, the LDS frontier, the Mormon colonists came and settled the valleys along the Fremont River, right down to the location of Fruta. And so what you guys were talking about in terms of work and place of residence, became central to Capitol Reef's history with that little village started in the 1880s and um, not exactly abandoned, but almost abandoned by the 1960s when the Park Service bought up most of the remaining private properties. But much of the literature of Capitol Reef goes back to reminiscences and nostalgia about growing up in Fruta. And then there's a whole other line of, of exploration that comes from tourists and canyon years and canyon country devotees and artists and photographers and that's why we all have so much to work with in these readers there's, there's so many different ways to experience the landscape to that point i think the in ways to experience i think there's an interesting pacing here as well looking at, at canyon lands with its rivers that cut through it and the the ability to to almost literally whisk through this country on a on a rapid 
um, and, and those narratives from the early, you know, Powell explorations and such where they, they're spending, you know, a day and a half in what would now be considered the, uh, the boundaries of, of Canyonlands National Park. And, and that very early exploration was both accessible. The rivers offered an accessibility that wasn't available in other ways for exploring these places. Um, and then there's that longer, like, like you're talking about, Stephen, with the settlers and, and that experience being more rooted in a place um, certainly in Canyonlands. One of my um, memorable experiences from a seasonal training was when an archaeologist described the native uses of Canyonlands in relationship to the, the establishments at places like Mesa Verde, where you had these, these longer um, term dwellings of, of settlers, and thinking about the ways that um, like it's the big city versus the rural outlying areas and, and having um, a, a population center such as we saw at Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon that was supported by places like what we now see as Canyonlands National Park or Bears Ears National Monument, these outlying areas. But I loved her description in that account of how the people who were living or who were in these outlying areas had to be um, a handier at doing a whole range of things in a, in a community like we see at Mesa Verde, the people were, were specialists. There were people who built their careers just on making those perfectly formed rock shapes to build the dwellings versus the much rougher dwellings that we see in the, on the Colorado Plateau where someone had to build the homes and plant the crops and, you know, find the water and hunt for food. They were, they were pursuing a wealth of different um, livelihoods. And I, and I see that parallel continuing through the history of these places and the ways that people um, were living and, and knowing this landscape. And I, I'm going to take that cue to tell my favorite story in the book, which uh, connects to the Native people you were talking about, Melanie. Uh, let me go back to screen sharing here. Um, I'll, I'll make it work. Hold on. There we go. So the, the native experience at Capitol Reef, I really wanted to find a way to incorporate native voices. The most powerful native experience is on the rocks. You know, it's the rock art that so many different tribes left, so many different cultures left in the park. Archaeologists came to Capitol Reef in the 20s, and Noel Morris from the Peabody Museum named the, the Fremont people from our local river, the Fremont. And Paiute and Ute and Navajo people lived here, ancestral Pueblo people lived here. We know that they all had complicated relationships with the place. This was a, as many places uh, in native territory. They, they saw particular spots in the water pocket fold as sacred. Ancestral Pueblo people left, left the country and their ancestors, today's Hopi and Zuni people, still have a connection and come through and talk about the rock art that is testimony to their passage. So unlike Bears Ears, where we have this rich first person native literature, so much of it being generated today, at Capitol Reef, I couldn't find any native voices to include as first person voices, but the, um, the cultural anthropologist Rosemary Susak, who works for the Park Service, did a bunch of interviews in the 1980s and summarized what those people told her. And so I did have that to rely on. But I also had the story of the shields, these spectacular anomalous rawhide shields that Bishop Ephraim Pechtol, whose name I've already mentioned, one of the, the local men who pushed for some sort of park in the area, the Wayne Wonderland Park in his first dream, Bishop Pechtol, longtime bishop in Torrey, everyone still calls him Bishop Pechtol, lived in Torrey for years and years. And even though it was after the Antiquities Act, the local folks were still going out and digging around in ruins and finding artifacts. Uh, Pechtol put them on display in his little store in Torrey. And the most amazing things he ever found were these three foot in diameter rawhide shields that he and his daughters Golda and Devona are holding in this picture. I was uh, working in the Park Visitor Center when the shields were still on display there. 
at times they were displayed in the Mormon Museum on Temple Square because Bishop Pechtel was convinced that they told the story of the, the Book of Mormon. And the archaeologists could never make any sense out of them. They couldn't tell if they were Fremont or Ute or Navajo or, or what. And so Bob McPherson wrote about this, and I use a piece of his and the reader to tell us the story, take us through the twists and turns of what happens to the shields. And what happens is Bishop Pechtel found them in 1926, but by 1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act had passed, and we we're starting to pay more attention to these objects made by all the cultures of the Native peoples of the Southwest and thinking about returning those, especially burial items and, and human remains. And so the shields were removed from display in the 90s, and the Park Service sent out a, a letter to all the tribes with some connection to the park asking, who, who gets these? Who do, who do these belong to? And the Navajo told the most convincing story. And it wasn't just a story. It was an incredible documentation of the history of the shields told by John Holliday, a Navajo medicine man who lived to be over 100. And when he was asked about the shields, he said, well, sure, I know all about the shields. I know who made them. I know when and where they were made. I know the names of the medicine men who were in charge of those shields for eight generations. Uh, John Holliday said, many goats with white hair created the shields, making them in the Kaibab Mountains in a thick pine forest with a circular clearing. Custody of the shields went to, in order, man who keeps his mouth open, then yellow forehead, tall skinny man, man who wants to sit down, side person, man who plays with the wooden cards, man with metal teeth, ropey, and finally to little bitter water man. And he even knew the names of the shields, earth protective shield, heavens protective shield, mountain protective shield. And so John Holliday said, ropey and little bitter water man had control of the shields at the time of the long walk when Kit Carson and the US Army forced Navajo people to leave their homes and march across to Eastern New Mexico and uh, basically live and die in a concentration camp. And Ropey and Little Bitter Waterman hid the shields so they wouldn't be captured. And then they died before they could tell anyone where they were. They were misplaced. And so when the park asked the Navajo about these shields, it was clear where, where they should go. And they now reside in the Navajo Tribal Museum in Window Rock, where they are used by native people, used by medicine people in the Navajo tribe. That's an amazing story. Thank it you. It is an amazing story. <laughs> uh, I, I want to jump in here and, and with a thought and maybe a transition. Um, one of the one of the contradictions or tensions that I hear in the um, in the origin stories of the parks in the early years of the parks is um, is this uh, the the contrast between wilderness and working landscapes. Um, the, you know, you mentioned 1964 is the, the moment that Canyonlands was founded, and of course, it's also the year the, the Wilderness Act was passed. Um, and that that sort of fundamental framing concept of wilderness seems to be um, right there at the beginning of each, all three of these parks. They visually um, appear to, um, they can be made to appear to have no trace of humankind, right? Um, however, access to those parks, Melanie, you talked about rivers as access routes. The primary access route for all three parks was uranium roads, like the Burr Trail, right? Um, these, these parks could only be perceived and, dare I say, consumed as wilderness spaces because of the fact that they were working economic landscapes in the context of the Cold War. Um, and that, there, there's, there's a, I guess, a foundational act of intentional perception there, right? <laughs> or of skewed perception, or um, so that the conceptual framework allows us to see the landscape um, in terms of specific sets of values. So um, all of that is by way of setting up a question. And the question is, as you look at the literary record of the parks, do you see a trajectory? Do you see change over time 
in the ways that in the values that people are using um, to perceive with right in the ways that they perceive the parks and and write about the parks that was a long-winded question but there it is <laughs> Can I just push back just a little bit in terms of, of access to the park? Um, many of the, 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 the first peoples apparently that came through arches were coming through, you know, they're, they're attempting to, they're, they're, they're approaching the Colorado River from the north. And at today's Moab, it's one of the best fords for a couple hundred miles either direction. So certainly for millennia, indigenous peoples, others would, would cross there. So they would, they would come down what today is, you know, salt wash and, and courthouse wash and cross. Um, we have petroglyphs and, and pictographs uh, in the park, but we don't necessarily know what those, what, what, what those travelers, what those uh, uh, people passing through um, thought of the place. Uh, and I'm so struck by those silences because we see it even among people who did write about that trip. Uh, B.W. Allred, who was a sort of a regional uh, historian, uh, his family ran a, a freighting business, a stage business that would go from uh, the depot, the, the railroad depot at Thompson to Moab. And they go along that same route and they did it for years. And I can't find, I, I find these wonderful descriptions nearly always complaining about how terrible the route was, um, how, you know, the, the mud was awful, the sand was awful, the, not a word about, about scenery, not a word about arches, not a word about what it looked like. Um, or we, we don't know uh, Denis Julien, the, the, the fur trapper, who left his name in several places on the Colorado Plateau. He writes his name in arches. We don't know what he thought. We don't know how um, those are people who are, who are working or, or traveling. Um, they're, they're sort of silent on what we are struck by, the, the wilderness qualities that you're, that you're hinting at. I'll throw in a notion around governmentality as well. I think as you look at the uranium story in, in, on the Colorado Plateau, we see this, this tension around governance and, and the large scale forces of a federal agency, not in this case a tourist agency, but the Atomic Energy Commission, really promoting uranium exploration in this area. And that, that sort of hand of the government um, played out in some, some interesting ways in this landscape. And, and I think the, the tension around sort of industrial corporate uranium exploration um, was also at play with almost a, a, an early tourist economy around, around uranium um, exploration. And, and there are these wonderful accounts of, of tour buses that would drive on these, as you mentioned, sort of built uranium exploration roads and drop tourists off, handing everyone a Geiger counter as they got off the bus. And they would have, you know, four hours to go out and, and search for uranium in this supposedly as yet unexplored area. And then, you know, hop back on the bus and travel back into town and have dinner and, and so forth. And it, it's, it's a different type of uranium exploration. And we, we saw you know, pictures on the front of Life magazine of the, you know, mother, father, and two children dressed in their, you know, head to toe in yellow carrying their Geiger counter being as a, as a promotion of a particular type of uranium exploration um, that tapped into some broader values around exploration, but also, you know, pursuit of wealth and fortune and, and simply family time, a way to be together, a way to get out there in that landscape. And, and I've always found that you know, from the time I was working there, I found that to be a, an interesting contradiction in the uranium story that certainly translates into the ranching story and, and these other, you know, livelihoods that, that took place in, in this area. And I think at Capitol Reef, the, the difference was that there were always people living there. You know, it was a place that had a town right in the middle of even the National Monument after it was established in the 30s. And uh, this little guest ranch on Pleasant Creek that Lert Nee, that wonderful name, Lerton Nee, established in uh, 1939, 
And he had people coming through, staying on Pleasant Creek, you know, now very much a part of the park, actually now a, a field station for Utah Valley University. And so um, the park was really centered around this little village of Fruta that attracted people who were drawn to the place. Uh, a bunch of kind of eccentrics starting in the 1930s and 40s, a guy named Doc Inglesby, who was a retired guy from Salt Lake, who was a rock hound and collected every piece of petrified wood within 50 miles of Fruta. And Dean Brimhall, who was fascinated by rock art and built scaffolding and ladders to photograph rock art, again, out for 100 miles around Fruta. And uh, Lert Nee had Joseph Muge coming every year to, to, and would guide him out for photographing for Desert Magazine and eventually Arizona Highways and Sunset. And, and so there was the, the Mormon pioneer uh, cluster of families, but there, there were also these layers of newcomers coming in who were really there for tourism, but uh, tourism, not, not for wilderness so much, but for the experience that tourists had in those days, adventure more than wilderness. They were in the wilderness, they didn't use the word. And um, that went all the way back to Dave Rust, who was a, an early guy who grew up in Wayne County and eventually built Phantom Ranch in the Grand Canyon, but loved taking people on horseback trips up on Boulder Mountain through the water pocket fold. Some of those people who were highly educated and wealthy people from back east kept journals that, that I could include in the, in the reader. So layer after layer of people that were having adventures but weren't thinking of it as wilderness. And perhaps I'll circle back around to the notion of wilderness with a, a short account of one way of looking at Canyonland's origin story. Um, and I'll go ahead and pop up a couple really wonderful maps here. Um, one of my favorite parts of this process in, in, in working in the archives and such has been to really explore in more depth the story of the proposed Escalante National Monument, which of course taps um, abuts the, um, both of these parks and, and overlaps with Canyonlands completely. And, and you know, this, this longer history here in the 1930s, um, Harold Ickes and others were proposing this, this large scale monument um, shown here on the map, the, the largest one being a proposed boundary, sorry, it's a little blurry from 1936, and then a smaller one in 1938, and then what ended up being established as Canyonlands in the middle um, in 1964. Um, and and what, I, what I've loved in learning more about the proposed Escalante Monument is how inclusive it was of working landscapes. And, and as Stephen points out with, with Capitol Reef and the uranium mining ongoing after the creation of a park, um, this proposal was much more inclusive of a landscape that would continue to have exploration for minerals and ranching and other uses, potentially even embracing some of those towns that were abutting the, uh, the, the um, park or the monument as, as we saw with, with Fruta and Capitol Reef. And so, so to me, this challenges a, a sort of pristine notion of a park and what a park is and how a park can be, um, you know, that is a social construct that we've created and that we kind of cling to in a particular segment of our contemporary society, but really um, it could have a lot of different ideas. And in reality, I think Canyonlands itself became almost the flip side of that and the creation of Canyonlands in 1964 in the same year that we passed both the Wilderness Act and the Civil Rights Act, which I think is a really interesting moment in time to think about. Um, it was created as a national park. It's among the last of our national park units today that was not a national monument in any form before it became a national park. And so thinking about what that means in terms of political designation, uh, a monument can be created by the president acting alone, whereas a park has to be created through Congress with these representatives of many different states acting together. And I think that's an important signature for 1964 and, and the Congress that existed then, but through the creation of Canyonlands, not first as a national monument, but as a national park and one of the last ones to come to, to be so created. And, and as you read the discourse around the creation of Canyonlands and Escalante National Monument, you see 
um, the notion of a, of a pure park coming out. You see this, this ideal of wilderness coming up again and again um, that must have been very popular in the public discourse in 1964 at the time of the Wilderness Act as well. Um, and, it, and it seems like such a contradiction with how we know the landscape was at, at that moment in time, but it does tap into that notion of exploration and, and being out in the landscape exploring things. Um, and you know, just a couple little quotes from this in, in 1935, uh, a letter about the Escalante National Monument from the Yellowstone superintendent to the um, National Park Service director. Um, in that letter, he said, quote, if we antagonize powerful Western interests, we may have to pay a stiff price, end quote. And I think that really speaks to what Canyonlands has become and continues to be in terms of the discourse around around setting aside land and, and conservation and, and wilderness in general. As a pair to this map, um, oh, my slides are in a different order than I thought. Here's Bates Wilson we've talked about uh, multiple times um, with, with his story uh, the, as the um, creator, the father of Canyonlands, so named when I was in Canyonlands around for the 50th anniversary um, of the creation of the park and Bates Wilson was certainly a figurehead of that. One of my favorite little trivia about um, Bates, though, is that he, he came to the Park Service as an assistant superintendent. It was his first um, job, but he was one of the few people in his Park Service career to see a park through in that full phase to be part of, of the advocacy to create the park to the leadership of the park and, and, and beyond that. Um, Bates with his famous uh, Dutch oven here, um, really working behind the scenes while many others were in the, in the foreground working to establish Canyonlands National Park. And we're going to go through a couple other images and then I'll show you the map here, but we, we see that jeeping exploration. And, and this is the story that, you know, whenever, whenever I see these images and I, it, it's unfathomable to me that jeeps were even operating or going through this landscape um, as they were and sometimes not entirely successfully. Um, this is actually Tug Wilson's Jeep, but um, I'm gonna pair that with a, a fun recollection from Kent Frost or what I think is really interesting. Um, and we've talked about Kent Frost and his, his jeeping business, which he began in 1953. So 10 years before um, the, the creation of Canyonlands. Um, and he talks about um, you know, having to continually think up new places to take his tours because people kept coming back to them again again and again, um, but he only references, um, he only recalls having three major mechanical problems um, in his years of Jeep guiding, um, including a broken axle, um, which he, he sent a message out to his, his wife, who then became the woman who had responsible for finding and delivering an axle to Ken Frost in the backcountry. Um, so so Fern, Fern Frost gets a lot of credit for her gumption as well in, in running that Jeep business. But my, my favorite quote from Ken on the Jeep business is, is he talks about do you remember in an oral history asked if he remembers any accidents on Elephant Hill, which for those who aren't familiar is still famed as one of the roughest Jeep roads in Canyonlands National Park, um, comparable to what you see in the Maze District, although it is in the Needles District. Um, and, and perhaps a little bit of a nightmare to the modern park ranger in terms of, of managing visitor traffic on a pretty rugged road. Um, including many accidents that I have known of in my time there. But to Kent Frost, he, he said he had not seen any serious accidents um, in his time there. He said sometimes people would forget that they were on a side hill and they'd back off the hill and their vehicle would tip over on its side or something like that, as if it were not a serious accident to actually roll your vehicle off of Elephant Hill, which speaks, I think, to the jeeping experience of Kent Frost early national park, but this is the map that I was, I was aiming for here, um, which is the, suggest, the proposed suggested development of Canyonlands National Park. Um, and as you look at this in a little more detail, you can see things um, like at Upheaval Bottom, where, the, um, where many of you may have launched a, a river trip at some point in time, um, the proposal for a campground, a picnic area, boat tours, Jeep tours. Um, there are snack bars down there alongside the river in that proposed development of the park. And so I think that contradiction that I was referencing earlier is, is around 
a park notion that takes and transforms wilderness in some particular way. The motivation to set it aside and designate it as a park was firmly rooted in a sense of protection of keeping a place wild. And yet the whole history of, of, of tourism in the area had been about exp exploration and access sort of tapping into this notion of keeping something, uh, keeping something wild and then transitioning when the park was created to a proposed development that put out snack bars and picnic tables and bridges and roads pretty thoroughly throughout, throughout Canyonlands. And, you know, in that interest around how management happens and what management does to a landscape, my colleagues and I at Canyonlands were endlessly fascinated that this, many of these things that were envisioned never came about that Canyonlands kept a particular type of character um, that maybe stands apart now in, in, in other national parks. It's one of the places where, where park rangers still field those questions of where can I get something to eat in the park and the answer is nowhere. Maybe you brought something with you, but we don't have a snack bar here. Thanks, Melanie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in a question from the chat thread um, and this is from uh, Brandon Durfler. And uh, be before I read it, I want to invite others who are listening to uh, drop questions uh, or remarks into the chat thread. Uh, I also want to just note that we've got about 25 minutes left. And so um, we'll probably move, move to a Q&A for the last 10 or 15 minutes uh, if, if we get some good questions here in the thread. Um, this, uh, but I've got some of my own questions too, if we don't. So. <laughs> um, the question from Brandon is um, much of the recent history, much of the especially recent history of these parks consists of battles over landscapes, which are a natural extension of the designated parks. Sometimes these surrounding lands are annexed to the park, such as Lost Spring Canyon and Arches or Upper Salt Creek and Canyonlands. Most, however, remain multiple use BLM administered lands. Um, to what extent do the national park readers touch on the ongoing conflict between conservationists who seek greater protections for these wilderness quality park adjacent landscapes and those predominantly but not exclusively locals who wish to benefit economically from these lands? So there's certainly a fair amount of that uh, going around uh, near arches, as, as Brandon uh, uh, suggests. Um, and this relates also to, to Melanie's point about a working landscape and, and the tension with wilderness. Um, in, in arches, there's, there's one remaining uh, uh, building that was, that was a residence other than uh, National Park Service, and that's the, the so-called Wolf Cabin. Um, John Wesley Wolf, to, uh, uh, homesteaded there and then it became, uh, when he left, it became the Turnbow Cabin. Um, and then the, the grazing rights were, were picked up by uh, uh, a man named Elizondo who continued to use them for a while. Uh, and it was af after the creation of the monument, it was this constant thorn in the side of the management. You could just say, it's like, we need, to, we need to get rid of that. Um, there are still existing uh, cattle driveways uh, in arches. They haven't been used in years, uh, but as I understand it, they, they still could be. Um, during the uranium prospecting era, there was uh, uh, many, many times that, that rangers would find um, flags and, and uh, cairns and such that had been placed there by, by miners. Um, Stephen's story about uh, when Capitol Reef was was expanded. Uh, very similar, literally that that same moment where LBJ is trying to find his pants, which was a common problem for him. Um, he expanded uh, arches enormously, and and to both of your points, he could do that with a stroke of a pen. It's a much more uh, uh, fraught thing to to try to create a, a national park. Um, arches became a national park in 1971 without a whole lot of, of complaints, but it, when it was expanded in 1969, there was a town council meeting in Moab, one of, one of many, uh, where Bates Wilson just was taking abuse from, from all sides, uh, being accused of making promises about Canyonlands National Park that weren't being kept, uh, 
just the, the, the same kind of language that we hear today about locking up resources, uh, taking away mineral resources, taking away uh, uh, grazing and, and other possibilities. And, and of course, your, your notion of, of adventure, Stephen, that you talked about, what does Moab call itself? You know, the adventure capital of the world, even if it's just, you know, you're renting some vehicle with big tires and you're driving it on pavement. Um, that that's, passes for, uh, for adventure now. I'll go next because Melanie's gonna have the most complicated answer to this because of Canyonlands and Bears Ears and Glen Canyon and all the complications there. But um, uh, Capital Leaf certainly has its tensions as well. We still have stock, stock driveways, but all but one of the grazing permits has been purchased or retired by nonprofits. But the local folks in Wayne County, and there are only 2,500 people in Wayne County in, in 2,500 square miles, uh, are still pretty suspicious of the park, largely because of Charlie Kelly, who was the first superintendent. He was, he was there in the 40s and 50s, initially as the first caretaker for the little unfunded national monument, and eventually becoming the first paid superintendent. And Charlie Kelly was uh, a nasty man by all, by all accounts. He was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. He hated Mormons. Uh, he was always getting in, in verbal fisticuffs with the local folks and storming out of meetings. And there's still a remnant of that even today, although it's going away as older people move on and don't remember that and new superintendents live in town and make friends. Um, Capitol Reef's boundaries butt up against National Forest BLM land and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in its 19, 1996 incarnation. You know, the Circle Cliffs and the Escalante were considered by that superintendent, Bob Hyder, when he drew boundaries for a new Capitol Reef National Monument. He thought it, he might just include those in a new Capitol Reef, enlarged Capitol Reef National Monument, but he thought it would be just too big and too controversial. Um, that, that goes right back to what Melanie was saying about the Escalante National Monument proposed in the 30s. You know, the bottom line is that all of, all of Southern Utah could be one big national park. That's really the bottom line. But now that Trump has withdrawn the circle cliffs from Grand Staircase, uh, there is increasing pressure on that western boundary of the southern part of Capitol Reef from uh, mining claims. There are pressures from the Trump administration for um, new oil and gas leases up on the San Rafael end of the park at the north. All of that's likely to change, we hope. And um, I do have this theory that I'll throw out right now that I think actually matters. And that is that we see flurries of conservation on the Colorado Plateau when we have a Secretary of the Interior who knows the Colorado Plateau. You know, Stuart Utah, Stuart Utah grew up, grew up in, um, in Northern Arizona. Bruce Babbitt grew up in Flagstaff. Those are the two secretaries of the interior that are responsible for so much of what we're talking about. And if Tom Udall is our next secretary of the interior, we're gonna see another flurry of, of great stuff. I want to begin a response by actually turning it back to you, Steve, um, with a question because in, in one of the early um, things that provoked my thinking about this particular controversy was work that you did with students at the University of Utah to explore the possibility of expanding boundaries around Canyonlands. And, and I think I would just be interested, now that I have you on the line, if you will, to hear your accounting of that experience and, and what happened when you, when you asked people directly in the landscape what they thought about expanding the boundaries of Canyonlands and, and maybe even a little bit of what what did your students assess from that? The formal write-up talks a lot about borders and boundaries and the fluidity of that, but I'm interested to know how the complexities of the behind the scenes conversation. Absolutely, well, thanks for asking, Melanie. Um, so in about 2009, uh, Bob Keiter, who's a professor of public lands law at the University of Utah Law School, and I taught a class, a seminar at the University of Utah with a group of brilliant students, just wonderful students. Um, I had the chance to do that when I was spending a year as a Stegner fellow at the Tanner Humanities Center during the centennial of Stegner's birth. And Bob came up with the idea of looking at the idea of completing Canyonlands, which came from Walt Dabney, who had been a superintendent at Canyonlands. 
And the, the idea made complete sense to get rid of all those straight lines and bring the boundaries of the park up to the erosional basin and have it match the land rather than just uh, go around in those square lines, those squares and straight lines to um, accommodate whatever local interests they needed to accommodate. So we, we took the students down to San Juan County and Grand County and interviewed lots of people. And the students, didn't, they were not all wilderness aficionados. They were not all outdoor conservation types. There was a, a wide spread. And Bob, they knew what Bob and I thought, but we tried to be reasonably neutral and let them hear from the county commissioners and people on the city council in Moab and uh, the director of development in San Juan County and Heidi Red out of Dugout Ranch. And, you know, we talked to a wide variety of people and they had a wonderful experience and they came away thinking that they did not want to be unilateral and say, here's what we think, we being the federal government or we being the park service, we think we ought to change these boundaries and that's it. They really tried to accommodate some of the, the, local, um, the local concerns and so as you said, Melanie, they, they were really intrigued with the tensions between the park and the BLM at, at that boundary, you know, multiple use versus the park's mandate of, uh, you know, preservation and enjoyment. And that's where, that's where they landed in terms of their, their recommendation. They, they didn't think the boundary itself mattered so much as long as you could um, make sure that there was real cooperation and kind of co-management. Uh, that was before people started really grappling with the idea of co-managing with native people as well. Now that we've got bear's ears, that, that's another layer, but they, um, they tried really hard to take their personal experience and match that up with what they were hearing from people like Bill Boyle, the editor of the San Juan Record, and people that spoke with great passion about not wanting to see the part get too big and not necessarily the, the standard right-wing line of locking things up, but some nuance. So the students, the students really were going after that nuance. I love that. And I think, I think what, you, what you speak to in terms of, of narrative comes out and, and how that, that deep connection to place pervades any conversation that, that you enter into um, in that landscape. And whether it's, it's pro-park or anti-park or pro-monument or, or pro-exploration, there, there continues to be that narrative around you know, a deep love of the place. And, and to the point that of the question of you know, how do we incorporate this in the book and in the writing, um, that to me is what stands out, is no matter who is writing about what they imagine for the future of this place, you can feel that deep connection to the place and the value of it. Um, whether that comes from spending time there or talking to people or listening to people in that landscape, I think that that strikes me as something your students experienced in just in getting to hear the many ways that people value a place. And, and I think, you know, perhaps it's a particular challenge in, in anthologizing different accounts to really um, account for how people love a place differently and, and in their act in their visions for the future of a place. And Canyonland certainly has prompted many, many visions um, for the future. Um, I think about um, standing at Grand Viewpoint um, and, and feeling that sort of weight of a management perspective, but looking out at, at hundreds of miles of, of land that were beyond the park boundaries, but still very much connected to the scenery, to what I was seeing there and the, the visual experience, the visual aesthetic of the place um, that you know, can very readily be altered by roads and oil rigs and, and so forth. Um, and and San Canyonlands is a great place for thinking about scenery and the aesthetic value of that and, and putting that into contrast with economic drivers and economic motivations um, that are, that are, that continue to be contested. And I think that what, what I hope to do in the King Lens Reader is really to bring it to that level of co-management and really exploring what co-management looks like in practice and, and how that can be, you know, co-management across agencies, which any agency employee is, is forced to do um, be, 
in their land, in their water, in their air, all of those things that do cross borders. Um, but then, as you say, looking to co-management with Native people and co-management with others who value place outside of the models of governance that we are so familiar with in kind of our contemporary park system. Is that where you're bringing in bear's ears? I mean, how are you dealing with bear's ears? It, it changes almost every day <laughs> in how I'm dealing with it. Um, and I think, and I think, you know, it's, it's such an opportune, as, as someone mentioned earlier, an opportune way to really bring Native voices because there are so many accounts that are being shared currently about that landscape um, through the Bears Ears movement, which is just wonderful and, and needs to be captured in so many different ways. The, uh, you know, the Red Rocks Anthology, all of these other works are, are really beginning to capture that that body of work and so so being able to tap into that is a huge resource at this point in time. Um, I personally um, feel like they're the, the work of these anthologies is not necessarily about equal weight or equal power, equal value there. I'm interested in, in hearing, integrating that story into some of those management questions that I bring up uh, throughout that history of Canyonlands. I'm going to bring in a question from the chat thread um, that in our last uh, 10 or so minutes will bring us back to the readers, to the books. Um, and the, the question is uh, from someone at the Utah Division of uh, State History, but I can't see a name, it, which goes like this. Since each of you is dealing with a plurality of voices or writings, I'm curious to know whether certain narratives dominate and influence other subsequent writings and thinking about these places. Has Desert Solitaire, for example, established a narrative that's hard to shake? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, it has. Um, I, I sometimes think about sort of the Abbey effect that, um, that, that, that we don't necessarily see uh, people that you might expect to, to write about uh, arches. Um, they, they haven't directly. And I, and I wonder if it's, if it's because of this sort of um, monumentalness of, of Abby's uh, piece. Um, I think in some ways his, his experience is so, it's, it's transitional and it's certainly gone as he knew as he was uh, publishing it. Uh, and of course he went, uh, what, 10, 11 years between having the experience and writing about it. He was uh, part-time, uh, he was a seasonal uh, ranger in 1956 and 57, just as roads were getting paved, new visitor center, all these, these, these new things uh, uh, coming online. Um, and he published, it, published the book in 1968, but he very much inspired some of the others that, that have written about it. Um, Jim Stiles, perhaps most uh, uh, prominently or, or most prolifically, certainly, um, in, with his Canyon Country Zephyr, um, very much, you know, he, he admits outright that uh, he's, uh, he's an Abbey uh, uh, protege, uh, but also Amy Irvine's uh, a recent Desert Cabal, in which she answers Abbey chapter by chapter. And so I'm going to, I'm planning on beginning the Arches Reader with the first morning, uh, first chapter of uh, Desert Solitaire, and answer it with the first morning, the first chapter of Desert Cabal. There's really no writer comparable to Abby at Capitol Reef. You know, I was lucky to have lots of choices, I think because of that transportation corridor that always came through Capitol Reef. You know, the, the only highway through South Central Utah went right through Capitol Gorge from the 1800s to 1962 when the paved road was built down the Fremont River and people have just kept coming and living and writing. Um, you know, Wallace Stegner was in love with Capitol Reef right from the time he visited Fish Lake as a Boy Scout when he lived in Salt Lake as a kid. But he didn't write memes about Capitol Reef that influenced everybody else. It appears in his writing, and I include that writing in the in the reader. And um, and there's really no one else. There's certainly no one like Abby. No one who really controls the narrative in that way. I'm 
struck in the narratives that I have read about Canyonlands around the prominence of that industrial tourism narrative, how, how strong it is and how in the many people who have written about Canyonlands um, since its inception as a national park and, and prior to that through that exploration. But when, when I learned of this series and was invited to participate, the first essay that I thought of and wanted to include um, was written by the writer Jack Turner called The Maze and Ara. And, and I remembered it as something that I had read when I had first moved to Canyonlands and had struck me then, but then when I returned to it and revisited it, I was, I was immensely struck by um, how he grappled with both the, the experience of production, writing photography that make a place known, um, and that kind of industrial tourism uh, experience as it contrasts with the exploration that he valued so, so much. And, and in the story, he tells of, of his first experience to Canyon, in the Canyonlands area, arriving in the maze, literally in a plane crash, um, crashing down in the maze district, um, having the pilot head off towards Anderson Bottom in hope of, of being, you know, getting help and him hanging out by the plane, um, not really wandering from, from the site. And, and what he describes as a feeling of boredom, of, of actually being bored. He wanted to climb the rocks. He wanted to be out exploring and doing things and sitting and waiting was boring to him. And, and when his, um, you know, the, his funder came to rescue him and they, they land and they had a few hours to go, to go do that work of exploration, uh, they, they stumble upon the harvest scene uh, in the maze. And, and I'm gonna go ahead and quickly share uh, a quote from that essay. Um, and I'll put it visually for those who are visual learners. Um, but he, he talks about when he stumbles upon the, these you know, larger than life um, figures on the walls, how overcome he was by them and how he took a moment to photograph and to record and document that experience and then left and went and told people all about the rock guard and the amazing life altering experience that he'd had there. And then he goes and he returns and he get, comes back to the to the scene now with you know his his wife and other explorers and and he talks about how changed his experience was. Um, he talks about how the the primary means of of bringing the natural and cultural worlds closer is mass tourism. The pictographs and the maze started down that path when I yelled for Huntley, took photographs, researched rock shows, and when I brought others there. Had we remained silent, others could have, for a while, shared that powerful experience. And what if everyone remained silent? And I feel that tension among these writers of wanting to both share and protect, of not wanting to, to destroy the thing that they most love, which maybe isn't the place, but maybe the sense of discovery and, and that experience of learning about a place, even more so than the place itself, and the tension that comes with doing what Abby did, doing what others did, of making it known. And I think photography maybe is, is an enormous element of this. You, you've certainly written about that, Stephen, in, in, in your book. Um, Joseph Munch's uh, cover of Life magazine, uh, Delicate Arch, in, in 1953, um, in a sense, you, you could, as, as uh, uh, Jack Turner suggesting, it's, it's stealing that experience from, from other people. Uh, how many millions and millions of photos have been taken of that, uh, that amazing site? Is, is it the same? It, it almost certainly isn't. And, and when you've seen too many pictures, then it's really hard to shape your expectation to the real place when you, when you finally get there. And yet, the, you know, the great conservation photographers, Philip Hyde, especially, who photographed for Sierra Club books in the 60s, talked eloquently about how you had to take those pictures and you had to publish the books. The Sierra Club exhibit format books like the Glen Canyon book that David Brower published as an elegy to the place no one knew. You know, if more people had known about it, maybe there wouldn't be a dam. So it, it's the, exactly the tension that we're talking about between the good work that those photographs do and the the work that the photographs do to kind of screw up our expectations and experience of, of being in the place silently. The first place, I, the earliest place that I've seen that dynamic described is in Margaret Fuller's book, Summer on the Lakes in 1843, where she talks about visiting 
Niagara Falls and having the experience ruined for her because she'd seen so many prints and postcards of the falls before getting there. Um, I'm going to bring a, a comment in from the, the uh, chat thread, um, which is about the current role of indigenous people in relation to the national parks. Um, the, the writer says, there was so much hope shown in the role of indigenous people in the creation of Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante, and we see what happened there. Um, and then they remark that they're not they're not hearing much these days about what's going on with the involvement of indigenous peoples in the parks. Um, I'm not sure that there's a question there, but I, I want to bring that um, observation in from the chat thread. And then I want to usher us out with a last question, and these will have to be short responses since it's 527. Um, what, tell us a quick story about an editorial adventure about coming across something in the archives that just lit you up. And my, my own story is about um, sitting in the rare books room at the University of Utah Library holding uh, Bert Loper's typescript of his journal of, the, of his 1939 trip through the Grand Canyon in my hands and, and uh, feeling a connection to, to him. Uh, I, have a, I have a story, a quick story. I found on the bookshelves in the Park Library an obscure 1986 Utah State University master's thesis in history called Capitol Reef, the Forgotten National Park. It was written by a guy named Jonathan Thau, T-H-O-W, and it was terrific. And I wanted to use excerpts from it. And Utah State told me that I couldn't use those excerpts without his permission, but they had no address or contact info for him. And the web, as powerful as the web is, it could not give me Jonathan Thau's location or who he was. He wasn't an academic, didn't stay in history. And literally a year and a half went by where I, I basically stalked him through the internet. And I finally found him. He became a US Navy judge advocate, an international law expert and commanding officer of the Naval Justice School in Newport, Rhode Island. And so I called the Naval Justice School and I got their their phone message that said, punch in the last, you know, the first three letters of the person you're trying to reach. And by God, I got him. And uh, he, he called back and he was just delighted. You know, this was a, a long ago part of his life. He had moved on from Capitol Reef history, you know, many, many, many years ago. But he was, he was kind of thrilled to see that I had rediscovered this and was pleased to have us reprint the stuff. And I was pleased that I found him. So mine is sort of collective is where I, I, I realized that I had a number of accounts of children growing up in the park. Uh, Sam Webster, who was a Westminster student and briefly a student of, of, of Stevens. Um, Esther Stanley, who was John Wesley Wolfe's granddaughter, who grew up, uh, spent a couple of years now in, in that, uh, uh, that cabin. Um, Cindy Wilson, Tug Wilson, uh, talking about what it was like to, to grow up in the park. Uh, and just to, to get that sense of really uh, uh, living in that place. And I'll throw in a non-archival experience that came in, uh, in, a, in my pursuit to find contemporary diverse voices to include and, and feeling the, the strain of that um, desire and sitting and listening to the poet Tony Wynn um, a colleague start a, reading a poem aloud and slowly realizing that she was talking about Canyonlands, talking about my place and, and hearing that and hearing that diversity of perspective that comes from a you know, New York City woman writer um, in this place and landscape and, and connecting with that was powerful for me. That's awesome. Um, so we're at 530 and there is another panel to come and um, so we should uh, we should close this one down. I want to um, I want to thank the three of you. Uh, this has been a really fascinating discussion and um, I think really demonstrates the, the value of these readers for bringing out the stories of these parks and, and deepening and enriching people's experiences of these parks. Um, I also want to thank Glenda Cotter and Tom Krause, uh, Hannah New and John Alley at the University of Utah Press, uh, as well as Kim Robinson at the University of California Press, uh, 
Uh, and finally, I'd, I'd really like to thank Jedediah Rogers and the Utah Division of State History for organizing us and for organizing this conference. This has been a, a great discussion. And thank you. Thanks to the three of you again. Hey, let me just chime in that this has been an absolutely delightful conversation. Um, very insightful. I can't shake the image of LBJ pulling up his pants and increasing the size of the National Monument sixfold. But so many interesting stories. I hope folks check out these books. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking the time to present as well as those in attendance for joining us. We do have a session coming up at six. It's a separate uh, link that you'll have to join. And it's on uh, rights, thinking about individual rights and communal rights on public lands. So I hope you join us for that if you're available. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Jed. That's great. Melanie, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Lance. Bye, Jed. Bye, Melanie. Bye, thank you, Lance. Bye guys. Bye. Bye-bye.